Hey everyone, I'm Nathan. Welcome to Reunion. I'm excited to have you here with us for our online gathering. Today we're continuing our series called The Story of God. The Bible is a story. It's a single unified story about God, humanity, and the world, and it points its readers back to Jesus. In this series, we're working to understand what the Bible communicates within the context of this great story. So Jeff's going to be continuing the story today, but before we get to him, let me share about the ways that you can connect with us here at Reunion. Reunion is one church in two locations with a simple mission of helping people find their way back to God. We believe we're all trying to find our way, and we invite you to do that with us in community. For those of you who are just coming across our YouTube page, uh, let me be the first to welcome you for the very first time. We're so glad that you found us online. No matter where you are on your faith journey, I want you to know that you are welcome here. If you're in the Boston area and you're looking for a community to explore faith with, I want to invite you to participate in one of our in-person gatherings on Sunday mornings. We have two locations, uh, one that meets in Somerville and one in downtown Boston. I also want to invite you to join one of our many community groups that meet across the greater Boston area. Today is a perfect time to join uh, as we just kicked off a new season of community groups. We have a number of groups that meet online, in person, and some that do a hybrid. You can find all the details for those groups, for our series, for everything online on our website, reunionboston.com. If you have your phone handy, you can actually feel free to scan the QR code using your camera and it'll take you directly to our connection card. And if you fill that card out, someone will reach out to you to answer any questions that you might have about faith or how you can be a part of our community. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram and it's a great way to know what's going on at Reunion. Now let me hand things over to Jeff as he continues our series, The Story of God. Hey everyone, my name is Jeff Oaks. I'm glad to share this message with you today. As the weekend of Christmas approached this past year, my family and I became nervous about our planned road trip to go see Jennifer's family down in Georgia for the holiday. And you might recall that a major storm was approaching and the local weather people were sounding the alarm about snow and ice and fierce winds. We had intended to leave early Friday morning for our 15-hour drive so that our arrival at Jennifer's aunt and uncle's place wouldn't be too late at night. But doing so meant we would be departing right into the teeth of the storm. And I was nervous, to say the least, about taking that kind of risk. I mean, the weather reports were sounding scarier by the day. On Thursday night, we had all of our bags packed, and we went to bed with this agreement uh, Jennifer and I had that if we woke up to snow or ice, we would wait, but if the roads were clear, we would, we'd go for it. So at 3.30 a.m. on Friday morning, a very groggy Oaks crew trucked our bags out to the car with winds howling, but no snow or ice to be seen. Now, driving at that hour of the morning on any day of the year would mean that it's dark. But on this particular night, it was as if the sky had pulled the blinds shut. I mean, it was pitch black out. There wasn't a hint of natural light to be found. Jennifer is our designated morning driver for family road trips. She's the early riser, and I'm rather a night owl kind of person. <laughs> anyway, so she's the one who pulled our car onto the highway, and as we headed out into that darkness, she was driving. And I don't want to get anyone too anxious when I say that the winds were strafing our car with sheets of rain that sounded like a rat-a-tat-tat from a snare drumming. I mean, a big gust of wind would hit, and you could just feel the vehicle shudder. And I was sitting in the passenger seat, holding tightly onto the door and my seatbelt. I was supposed to be sleeping so that I could be well rested for the second half of our drive, but it was nearly impossible to rest. Every blast of wind startled me back to awareness of the storm. We drove for hours into the wind and darkness that seemed unrelenting. And at 8 a.m., it was still as dark as when we had left. The storm was absorbing any of the morning light that threatened to break through that gloom. 
By this point, I had given up on sleep. Unfortunately, we had not encountered any snow or ice, but the darkness that enveloped us felt so overwhelming and foreboding that I began to wonder, will the morning sun ever shine through? Have you ever craved <laughs> even just a little bit of light in the midst of a darkness? And when you're when you're engulfed in gloom and shadow, even a little bit of light changes things. It just does, right? And that's true in more ways than one. It's not only physical darkness that can loom over us and obscure our vision. Sometimes we need light to break through the clouds of a different kind of storm. The prophet Isaiah described this pretty well for us in chapter 8 of his book. He foreshadowed a time of grim circumstances for the life of God's people. And these are his words in Isaiah 8.22. He says, Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Some of us, when we look at the world right now, we see nothing but darkness. Make no mistake, the world has problems. Poverty, sickness, disease, hunger, discord, I mean, racism and mass shootings going on. There's a war going on on the other side of the world. We seem to recognize our problems. We can identify them without much difficulty but we cannot seem to solve them. And so far, I'm only referencing the big issues of this world, but each of us face our own problems too, personally. And some of us are deeply lonely. We feel alone in the world. And it's like a personal storm cloud is following us around. Just like in the cartoons, you know, when the rain seems to track the person and only fall on them. Some of us feel that way right now about how we're living in this, this world of ours. Some of us struggle with feelings of emptiness. Maybe for you, it feels like life is pointless, like there's a deep abyss surrounding you without hope or joy, like you're surrounded by bleak darkness. And some of us are just restless and dissatisfied. I mean, there's an unquenchable hunger that drives us, but Nothing seems capable of uh, appeasing it, you know. And the recognition of that hunger being unappeased is something that we're avoiding at all costs because we don't want to have to face those shadows. Darkness is not only a physical state of being. It can be an emotional and spiritual condition that we endure. And sometimes that's only occasional. Sometimes it's persistent. But it always seems to be looming out there. Even our successes are temporary. I mean, how many of us have had difficulty lately enjoying or celebrating the joys of life? Because we're just waiting for the other shoe to drop from the pandemic or for some other national news event. Or how many of us can really only invest a fraction of ourselves into relationships because we're worried about abandonment or being hurt. Darkness. The message we read about in Scripture has been confirmed through each of our own experiences. Human life is in a dark place. And the more we look for solutions, the more we think about it, the darker it seems to get. It's like driving through the night into the middle of a raging squall sometimes. Then they will look toward the earth, Isaiah said, and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. We can all identify with what Isaiah says because we've experienced this too. <laughs> and on that happy note, <laughs> you know, we're in the middle of this message series at Reunion called The Story of God. We believe the better we understand the story of God, the better we're able to understand our own stories. 
when we see the larger themes that are running throughout all of the Bible, we come to realize that Scripture is not just a series of random books that were thrown together with a bunch of disconnected tales of people from the past, but it's a nuanced and comprehensive portrait of who God is and who we are in light of Him. And during the last few weeks, we've learned that God created everything, including us, right? Humanity. He was intentional about making us and drawing a relationship uh, into being with us. And that's a foundational truth that you can build your life on. But we've also discovered that we're complicated creatures, right? God gave us the freedom to make our own choices, and we've made a hot mess of our lives and of the world. Last week, we examined the life of Abraham, a man chosen by God to be the father of a nation that would bring shalom, the, the fullness of God's blessing to the earth. But if you look back in Scripture, and you examine the historical record of Abraham's people, it is littered with failure and faults and faithlessness. These people... God's people seem incapable of experiencing the shalom of God for themselves, let alone bringing it into the world. In short, the Old Testament situation that we read that leads up to what we're going to talk about today, it's a pretty bleak situation for God's people. But here's the good news. God doesn't give up on humanity. He doesn't retreat from us or give up and, and and just start it all over again. I mean, I think that he could have, but that's not who he is. Instead, he chooses to lean in toward us. I love how Isaiah characterizes the future that God has for his people. You know, he begins with those words that I read earlier, that the people will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and gloom. They'll be thrust into utter darkness. But in the very next sentence, he declares for us, nevertheless, that time of darkness will not go on forever. Those people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Isaiah wrote those words 800 years before that promise was fulfilled. 800 years in advance, Isaiah was letting humanity know hope was on the way. Now, if you've ever been convinced that the darkness of this world and in your own life is evidence that God is absent or indifferent or that he's angry with you, you know, if you've ever believed that God just does not care about you, that he's abandoned you, you need to hear these words today. Nevertheless, a time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. People who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, the light will shine. So some of us come here today believing that the dark clouds we've been walking through are going to last forever. Just like I felt as we were driving through that unrelenting darkness during that storm back in December. Finally, that morning, just before 9 a.m., and I marked it on the clock when it happened, it was a break in the clouds, and light began to stream down on our car at last. I'm not going to embellish the scene for you. It's not like the clouds parted and a beacon of light illuminated just our car, you know? But a soft warmth began to emerge and the shadows began to retreat. And that sense of fear and worry about what was ahead of us began to be replaced by relief and the joyful anticipation of being reunited with family. The storm had passed along with the dark night. And we were exalting that morning in the beautiful light of day. And today, I'm praying that you will hold on to these words and embed them down deep into your heart. That time of darkness 
It's not going to go on forever. The, the darkness that we've been enduring in our lives, it's not permanent. There is a light that dawns on this room. But please take note. It's not a light that we develop ourselves. It's not a light that we create as a result of our own effort or industriousness or good goodwill toward other people. You know, the light that breaks into the darkness comes to us. And this is the apex of God's story in Scripture. God was never going to be content to leave us flailing in the dark. He loves us too much. So God delivers light to us. In fact, the light is God with us. Emmanuel, Jesus, is the light of the world. In John's Gospel, which is his biography of the life of Jesus, he leads off with this paragraph. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. I mean, really quickly, this is scripture that's speaking of Jesus and connecting Jesus into the greater story of creation, going all the way back to before any of it was made. And then in verse 14, John writes these words. So the word became human. And made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love, faithfulness. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Man, the story of God hinges on this moment. Everything that comes before was leading up to this. And everything that comes after is a wash in the glow of God with us. Light enters the world. And the darkness cannot overcome it. That's who Jesus is. He is God intervening. He's God arriving. God coming to us. And the light that has dawned is not of our own doing. It's God choosing to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Yeah, things are very dark. When we look at the earth, we see that it seems to be getting darker and darker. Nevertheless, remember, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot extinguish it. Jesus' arrival is like the dawn of that light, just emerging through those clouds. Eventually, will be the flood of full-on day, bright, shining, illuminating everything. Jesus is a new beginning for the world. We can't really grasp the full meaning of the story of God until we see Jesus at the center. The epic scope of the Bible, the chronicle of God's work in human history, culminates with the Son of God's arrival. When God's creation that was fouled by human rebellion, you know, all of all of that history of brokenness, none of that surprised God. He had a plan in place. He would redeem creation back to himself in spite of ourselves. He would purchase it back for himself so that we could be restored to what he had always intended us to be. Now, I love how one of Jesus' other apostles begins his biography of Jesus' life. The first verse of Mark's first chapter states this, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. I mean, he just kind of encapsulates everything about what Jesus is and what he means for us. He, he first calls it gospel 
which means good news that will impact everyone's circumstances. And then he says, Jesus, Messiah, that means Savior, the one who comes to rescue. And then he tells us, this is God's Son. This is the Word made flesh. Mark opens up his book about Jesus by explaining in the very beginning, God has taken decisive action in Christ to redeem and save the world. Everybody needs a new beginning. Israel certainly did. We do too. When God told Abraham that through you and your offspring, I'm going to bless the world, he was alluding to Jesus. And so unless you understand the story of Israel up to this point, you can kind of get Jesus. Well, I mean, you can get Jesus, but but you don't fully get him. (laughs) Which is why so much of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life reference back to Old Testament prophecy. It's why so much of Jesus' own teaching drew upon the Old Testament stories and history. I mean, when Mark tells his first-hand account of Jesus' life, it's filled with Israel's history and stories. Why is that the case? Because the lineage from Abraham to Jesus is long. There's 2,000 years of history there. But Jesus is the promised one. Those pages of Scripture were foretelling. He's the one that grafts us into the family. In Christ, God has shown us the lengths to which he's willing to go in order to make us his own. A plan that he put in place all the way back before Abraham, before that covenant, all the way back to the very beginning. Jesus announces that the good news of God's power to save his creation has arrived. God has entered human history in love and power to liberate and heal and renew the whole world. What does that mean for you and me? (laughs) Well, no matter what darkness you've experienced in your life, and there is darkness all around us, maybe you're going through a, a dark time right now, you can have hope. You can know that the darkness will never overtake the light. Jesus is our new beginning too. We have the opportunity to live in this good news rather than living in hopelessness. I hope you let that sink deep down into the marrow of your bones. Don't despair. Hope the light of the world entering our world is your hope if you'll grab it. You know, many of us have thought that God really isn't interested in bringing an end to the dark things in us. Maybe, maybe we think that really is the only thing he wants. You know, like he's kind of a cosmic killjoy. You know? Sin, laziness, greed, gluttony, selfishness. You know, we, we view every storm, every dark cloud as evidence that God's really just punishing us because he's bent on rooting out all the bad seeds. We've come to view ourselves as one of them. But here's the truth. God is most interested in letting old things pass away so he can bring about a new beginning in us and in this world. He's the God who makes all things new. In Jesus, we see that's his plan because Jesus was willing to die so we could start over again in him. We're not alone in misunderstanding God's intentions. The spiritual leaders of Jesus' day believed they knew and understood God. They read and applied scripture. Some might say they actually over-applied the rules and regulations of the Torah. They were experts on God and on godliness. And yet somehow they missed God in the flesh standing among them and showing them the Father. Jesus had some harsh words for them. He says in John 5, verse 37, the Father who sent me himself testified concerning me. You'd never heard his voice, 
nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Those were Jesus' words of rebuke and warning, really. Don't make the mistake of the Pharisees. They missed the light of the world in their midst and chose to stay in the darkness. We don't have to do that. Calling of Jesus is the same for us today as it was all those years ago when he first made it. The choice to welcome the light over darkness is ours to accept or decline. Jesus asks us to turn from the false views of the world that we have walked in and instead embrace the reality and the presence of the coming kingdom of God in him. You might not see the light of God breaking through the clouds immediately. You can trust the liberating power of God is now present. I mean, just like that storm was obscuring the, the morning light on our drive, it sometimes feels like the darkness has overpowered the light. But don't be confused. The light will break through. It is breaking through. Light is here. So leave the darkness of your old ways of life behind. Step into the light and trust Jesus for a new one. That's the invitation I'm extending to you today. Believe and accept the new beginning offered to you in Christ. Repent of old ways, dead and dark ways. I mean, some of us have been following Jesus for years. We've we believe that he's the light of the world, but we continue to walk in darkness. It's time to turn from those ways and allow the new life God has made possible in Jesus to flourish in us. I love the invitation that a young Charles Spurgeon gave during one of his first sermons. He was 20 years old when he wrote these words. He says, oh, there is in contemplating Christ a balm for everyone. In musing on the Father, there is a quiet for every grief. And in the influence of the Holy Spirit, there is a medicine for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself in God's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity, and you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed invigorated. He ends with these words. He says, I know of nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a meditation upon God. He's right. There is beauty in knowing goodness of God's light pierces through our darkness. The winds and the storms, they can rage in our world, but they will not overcome the light. We all need that hope, the hope of a new beginning. The storm clouds will part and light will dawn over us and over our world. God is with us. Jesus changes everything. Let's pray about that. Father, thank you for bringing light into this world, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Son of God. This, our Messiah, the, the hope that breaks through the difficulties and the pain and the loss of this world. Because just as Jesus was willing to lay down his life, but then rose from the dead and conquered sin and death, that hope is ours in him. And so, my Father, I pray this morning that you would just remind us of your great love for us, of the powerful light that you are making available to us. 
can pierce the darkness of our lives and of our souls. Father, give us the ability to grasp hold of, to never let go of, Jesus, our Savior. Father, we cling to you. We need you. We're so grateful that, that you love us enough and to bring us light. We pray for the ability to shine that light in this world as a reflection of your heart. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to move into a time of communion. You know, I, I've mentioned that this is an opportunity today for us to repent. And communion is a moment of repentance. Every time we take it, we're willing to allow our hearts to go to that place where we see our brokenness, see our waywardness, we see our, our own darkness, the darkness that we bring upon the world. And we're willing to turn from it and acknowledge that Jesus is the hope, redemption from that darkness. He's the forgiveness for sin that we need. He paid the price for those sins with his own precious blood for us. And then he conquered sin and death for us as he rose from the dead. And so today, as you take the bread and the cup and as you grab those elements maybe from your refrigerator, I don't know, but something that allows you to have this moment, you can taste the goodness of Christ. And you can remember the sacrifice he made. And you can choose to turn in the darkness of old ways to the new beginning he's made possible for us. And let's do that right now. never to foresee what you began we will sustain this we know this we know I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no Jesus Christ has broken every chain. All of the heavens and the earth announce the fullness of your worth. This we know, this we know. me will flee as we declare your victory oh this we long this we long I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no broken every chain he's broken every chain Jesus name will break every stronghold freedom is ours when we call his name Jesus name above Every other, all hail the power of 
is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Broken every chain. Let's close with our benediction. Open your story to the one who knows you. So much has already been written, and yet there are pages to fill. Cling to the one who has called you into something greater than yourself. May we see our scars in the likeness of Christ, the marks tell our story, that bear our testimony, and remind us of what was lost. May you experience resurrection with Christ. May our emptiness hold space for the work that God is still doing. Finally, let us bear witness with each other. We're certain we are not alone, but bound together in Christ. One body, one people, one story. Go forth in the name of the Father, who lives with us, in us, and around us. Amen.